Kavita. She has joined earlier. Yes, sir. I am here. I am here only, Kavita. I am here only. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Can I start now, ma'am? Sure, yeah, you can. You can start now. Pleasant morning to all. We welcome you all for this national webinar, Mapping the History of Pandemics, organized by the Department of History, Standard Fireworks Rajaratnam College for Women, Sivagas. Now I request Mrs. Lee Ramya, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of History, to welcome the participants. A pleasant morning to one and all. First of all, I thank God Almighty for giving us the strength and willpower to organize such a webinars and participating in such a webinars during this pandemic period. It's my immense pleasure to welcome on behalf of our management and principal madam to this national webinar. My hearty welcome to our resource person, Dr. Parvati Menon, who is going to deliver a speech on Mapping the history of pandemics. I wholeheartedly welcome you, ma'am. Then I welcome our faculty members of our college and the faculty members of other colleges and students of various colleges and the participants from all over India for this national seminar, such a webinar. Hope this webinar will be a fruitful session and let us transform the essence of this webinar what we have from this webinar to the future generation. Thank you. Megla, shall we hand the session to Kavita ma'am? Megla? Kumama? 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 Uh, yes, ma'am, I'm here, I'm here. Good morning, all. It's my pleasant privilege to deliver the presidential address. First and foremost, I congratulate the organizers of this national webinar on mapping the history of pandemics. The Department of History has been actively involved in various activities and this event is like another cherry on the top. The department always holds the credit of doing a number of innovative activities and the holistic efforts of the staff members have brought the department to greater heights. Coming to today's session, the topic chosen is really so wonderful and is very much needed at this hour. Because the more you know about the past, the better you are prepared for the future. Looking back, the history about the pandemics will not alone bring awareness about the deadly diseases that existed in the earth, but also helps to get rid of the fear and prepare ourselves to come out of this stalling situation as our human race did to survey in the past. I mean it very specifically because the earth has been facing several pandemics right from Anatoine plague during 165 to 180 to current COVID-19. 
I hope this meeting will be of great help to all of us to prepare ourselves for the post-COVID era. By learning how human race have overcome the series of pandemics in the early days. I believe the renowned chief guest of the day, Dr. Parvati Menon, will take us throughout the series of past pandemics and enlighten us the need for mapping the history of pandemics. I, from the bottom of my heart, take the opportunity to appreciate and congratulate the department staff members for organizing such a, such a thoughtful webinar. My best wishes are to the entire team for all of their future endeavors and grand success of this program. Without taking much of your time, I now hand over the session to the moderator. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Now I request Dr. M. Kavita. Assistant Professor in History to introduce the Chief Guest. Very good morning to all. I thank God Almighty to bring this wonderful day for us. I thank our management and our beloved Madam Principal Dr. T. Palneshwari for giving permission to conduct this one day national webinar. I thank our head of the department Mrs. V. Ramya to guide us to complete this process in a successful way. Now it's time to introduce our elegant chief guest, Dr. Parvati Manan, Assistant Professor of History, All Saints College, Tirupanandapuram, Kerala. Our charming resource person is working in All Saints College since 2009. She is credited with 10 national and international level publications. She gave number of talks on topics related to women empowerment and in various institutions. She initiated national integration program, national seminars, human rights forum and Vaitruka the museum in All Saints College. She has published a book entitled Three Centuries of Madras in 2008 and also edited a book Empowerment of Women Challenges and the prospects. Her areas of specialization are etymology, gender studies, and human rights. She is also a graded artist in light music with All India Radio, Trivandrum. She has given musical performances in channels like Surya TV. She owns a music group, M4M. She has also shared the stage with the playback singers like Srinivas, Vijay Yesudas and Sri Ram. I am very much glad to invite our chief guest to this webinar. Ma'am, we are waiting for your speech on the mapping the history of pandemic. Now I hand over the session to chief guest, Dr. Parvati Manan. Welcome you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Kavila, for that uh, very wonderful introduction. Before I begin, I would like to say that uh, it's a real honor for me to be a part of this national webinar which is being organized by the Department of History of the Standard Fireworks Rajaratnam College for Women Sivagasi. I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee members including the chief patrons Tilagavati Ma who is the president, then Arna Ma who is the secretary, then the patron uh, Dr. Palaneshwari, Palaneshwari Ma who is the principal of the college and also Ramya Ma'am, who is the convener of this webinar, as well as the head of the Department of History. My thanks are also due to my friend Kavita, who was my junior, junior in college in Lady Ruth Madurai, and also Mekhala Devi, Dr. Mekhala Devi, uh, teacher in the Department of History, and also I thank all the members of the committee who have made this national webinar a reality. So at the beginning, I would like to Tell you something about my topic, which is mapping the history of pandemics. So I thought that uh, many webinars are being held regarding the impact of the present pandemic. So I thought I will give a historical perspective of the pandemics for So a pandemic is actually an epidemic which is occurring on a very large scale, and we know that it crosses national boundaries and it affects people at a very high level, maybe a global level also. So throughout the history. Throughout the course of history, uh, plagues and epidemics have affected humanity. 
Sometimes they have even changed the course of history. And sometimes they have even ended civilizations. And when we look at history, there has always been an oscillation. What is oscillation? Change taking place. Once there would be a period of health, then there would be a period of disease, again a period of health, again a period of disease. So human civilizations have always been determined by epidemics and pandemics. So the word pandemic, it comes from the Greek word pandemos, where the word pan means all and demos means the people. So there have been a significant number of pandemics recorded in human history, which all of you have heard of. The smallpox, cholera, AIDS, influenza, etc. Among all these pandemics, the influenza pandemics are very unpredictable. But they are recurring events. And these influenza pandemics cause very severe consequences on societies worldwide. So these influenza pandemics have struck about three times every century since 1500s. That means every 15 to 20 years we have these influenza pandemics. So in the 20th century, we had three very important influenza pandemics. I'm sure all of you have heard of these. The Spanish flu, then the Asian flu, and then the Hong Kong flu. So each pandemic harmed human life and economic development. For example, the pandemic of 1980-1990, which is the Spanish flu, we know that now we are celebrating the 100 years of its uh, occurrence of the Spanish flu. It killed more than 20 million people in the world. And it has been cited as a very devastating pandemic in world history. But which was the most fatal pandemic ever recorded? It was a black death or the bubonic plague, which killed almost 200 million people in the world in the 14th century. Now let us uh, understand the features of a pandemic. A pandemic has special features like First, it has got a very wide geographic extension. A pandemic crosses continents, it is a global epidemic and it covers many countries. The second one is the disease movement. A pandemic doesn't remain steady, the disease moves via transmission from one place to the other. The third feature of a pandemic would be its novelty. What is novelty? See, none of us heard of the coronavirus or the COVID-19 pandemic until recently. So, this virus is new to us. So, the pandemic is actually a disease which is very new or sometimes it is a novel variant of the organism which is existing. Good. So, if you could just switch off your mics, it will be convenient. Thank you so much. The four feature of a pandemic would be, apart from novelty, it would be severity. We all know that. Pandemics are very, very severe. They are not at all simple to say. They are very, very fatal. The next feature of a pandemic would be its attack rate. So the pandemics are highly explosive. They are very dangerous. They are highly attacking and they are very, very dangerous also, which I already mentioned. The sixth feature of a pandemic would be the minimal population immunity. So pandemics are usually associated with minimum population immunity. So even in the present COVID-19 pandemic, we know that we are all trying to become immune, isn't it? So that's why we are popping in vitamin pills so that we develop immunity so that we don't get the disease. So population is, population immunity is considered to be a very important anti-pandemic force. And the seventh feature of a pandemic would be its infectiousness, its contagiousness. So pandemics are transmitted from one person to the other. The transmission can be direct, it can be indirect. So these infectious diseases 
are very harmful to the human beings. So these are the seven features of the pandemic. So these infectious diseases, they can cross borders in order to threaten regional stability, economic stability, and also global stability. And this has been demonstrated by earlier pandemics and also the present COVID-19 pandemic. So there is proof to say that the occurrence of pandemics has increased over the past century, mainly because of increased global travel. We have the air travel frequency, then we have the urbanization, then we have changes in land use, and greater exploitation of the natural environment. So these trends are going to continue. We know that urbanization is going to increase. More and more people are going to travel uh, globally, and also there will be changes in the environment. So we know that pandemics are going to come in the future also. So it was not until the shift to agrarian communities that the spread of these diseases they increase dramatically. So trade developed, so widespread trade came, and trade created new opportunities for humans and also animals to act. And this led to great epidemics. So the more civilized human beings became with larger cities, with more developed trade routes, and also increased contact with different types of people increased contact with animals, increased contact with ecosystems, we know that pandemics would continue to occur. For example, I would like to say that there were many zoonotic diseases which occurred earlier. What do you mean by zoonotic diseases? Diseases that started from animals. So in such cases, we know that even in history, we had instances of closing down of poultry markets. So a closing down of poultry markets was considered as a very important anti-pandemic force during the early times. So uh, despite the occurrence of pandemics throughout history, there has been one consistent trend over the time. And we know that is a gradual reduction in the death rate. So healthcare improvements have come nowadays. And also we know which are the factors that cause these pandemics and such things have been very powerful tools in reducing the impact of these pandemics over the years. Now, in many ancient societies, people believe that certain spirits and gods inflicted these diseases and uh, destruction upon these who, uh, mainly people who disobey gods I mean, they got the anger of the gods. So this unscientific belief and perception often led to very disastrous responses that led to the death of millions of people. An example I would like to say is that of the Justinian plague. Justinian was a Byzantine empire. Justinian was a Byzantine emperor. And during his period, the famous historian Procopius of Caesarea, he traced the origins of the Justinian plague to a bacteria and he said that China was the origin. And uh, this plague came via the land and sea routes to Egypt. And from Egypt, it entered the Byzantine Empire through the Mediterranean ports. Uh, Procopius, Procopius knew a lot, he knew a lot about the role played by geography and trade in spreading the plague, but still he blamed Emperor Justinian for the outbreak of the plague because he declared Justinian as a devil or a person who invoked God's punishment for his evil ways. So some uh, historians found that this event also ended Justinian's efforts to reunite the Western and the Eastern Roman Empire and it was this plague that started the beginning of the Dark Ages Europe. So luckily, humanity's understanding of the causes of the pandemics has improved. And that is resulting in a very drastic improvement in 
the response to modern pandemics. And we know that now all our governments are taking very efficient and effective response systems to stop or try to limit the spread of the disease. Now the practice of quarantine also. We all are very familiar with the word quarantine. Quarantine actually was uh, a word that quarantine was a word that started in the 14th century. It was an effort to protect the coastal cities from the plague. So the very careful and cautious port authorities, they asked the ships which were coming to Italy, uh, particularly to Venice, uh, from infected ports to be at the anchor for 40 days before they entered the city. So the origin of the word quarantine is from the Italian word quaranta giorni and that means 40 days in Italian language. But now we know that now quarantine is for 14 days not 40 days and later after the uh, middle ages the quarantine period was reduced to 30 days and it became trend time. Now, we know that the rising global connections and interactions are a very important uh, reason for the spreading of the pandemics. So man had, uh, first of all, we were in a small hunting group and then tribes were formed and then the metropolitan cities were formed. So throughout this transition, humanity's reliance on one another has increased and also has created opportunities for the disease spread far and wide. Urbanization in the developing world is bringing more and more rural people into the neighborhood areas, which are very, very dense. And when population increases, it is putting a great pressure on the environment. And that leads to pandemic. At the same time, passenger air traffic, people who are traveling by air, it has doubled in the past two decades, past two, 20 years. So these trends are having a very important role on the spread of this. So organizations and governments are asking people all over the world to practice social distancing. Now all of us are under social distancing. That is why we are sitting in our homes and doing all our work. But then can we maintain social distancing? Man is a social animal, so he cannot distance himself from the society. He cannot remain uh, away from his family. He cannot distance himself from his colleagues. He cannot remain away from his work. So it is more of physical distance. But the digital world is now very much flourishing because it has allowed people to maintain connections and trade like never before. Now I would like to turn your attention to 23 of the worst epidemics and pandemics that have occurred in the world. So I have a presentation for you. So I will be using that to show you. I hope you can see. Yes. So Mapping the history of pandemics. Uh, so uh, the first pandemic that occurred in history was the <coughs> pandemic that was there in China in 3000 BC. That is about 5000 years ago. An epidemic wiped out an entire prehistoric village in China. The bodies of the dead you can see there. They were stuffed inside a house and these bodies were later burned down. So no age group was spared. You can see the skeletons of children, young adults and middle-aged people inside the house. This archaeological site is now called the Hameen Banga and is one of the best preserved prehistoric sites in northeastern China. Archaeological and anthropological study indicates that the epidemic happened very quickly and there was no time for proper burial and so the site was not inhabited again. Now even before the discovery of Hamid Manga, there was another prehistoric mass burial site that dates to the same period and that was Niao Zikun. That is also in China, northeast China. 
So together these two discoveries suggest that an epidemic attack or ravaged the entire region and this was 5,000 years ago. Coming to the second pandemic, the plague of Athens or Athens. Around 430 BC, there was a war between Athens and Sparta, the rival cities of Greece, city states, and an epidemic destroyed the people of Athens and it lasted for five years. The death toll is said to be around one lakh, was about one lakh. Uh, the famous Greek historian Thucydides, you know that was also known as the father of scientific history. He wrote that, quote, people in good health were all of a sudden attacked by violent heat the head. There was redness and inflammation in the eyes, the throat or the tongue, and becoming bloody and emitting an unnatural and sweet breath. So what exactly was the source of the epidemic mm -hmm. has been a debatable uh, matter among scientists. And many people believe that it was mainly because of the overcrowding during the war time, that is the war between Athens and Sparta. So Sparta's army was stronger, of course, and the Athenians were forced to take refuge behind the fort. But despite the pandemic, the war continued till 404 BC and Athens was forced to uh, yield to Sparta. So this was the plague of Athens. The next is the Antonine Plague. I think Dr. Uma mentioned about it in her address. So many historians believe that this epidemic was brought to Roman Empire by soldiers who were returning home after a war against Parthia. So when the Romans returned to the Roman Empire, of course, they brought back spoils of the victory, but they also brought the Antonine Plague. So it must have killed about 5 million people in the Roman Empire then. And this epidemic also led to the end of Pax Romana, that is the Roman Peace, did it for about 200 years, from 27 BC to 180 AD, when Rome was at its peak. And uh, later, there, was, there were a lot of civil wars, and uh, barbaric invasions which infected Rome. So, Antonine Plague, 165 to 180 AD. Now, coming to the next one, the Plague of Cyprian, that also was in Rome. Cyprian was a bishop, St. Cyprian, he was a bishop of Carthage, Tunisia, and he described this plague as end of the world because it killed around 5,000 people every day. You know that is happening in the US also now, but then 5,000 people every day. So in 2014, archaeologists at a place called Lux Luxor, they saw a mass burial site of plague victims. So you will be surprised to know that this burial site had the bodies covered with thick layer of lime. Because lime was considered to be historically a disinfectant. I think even now we use lime as a disinfectant to boost their immunity, isn't it? Also, archaeologists found about three ovens, that is, uh, which were used to manufacture lime, and also the remains of plague victims were burned in a big bonfire. Next is the plague of Justinian, about which I mentioned earlier. The Byzantine Empire was attacked by this plague, which started the decline of the empire. And uh, some say that about 10% of the world's population died. You can see the picture of the emperor there. And uh, the plague is named after the Byzantine Empire, Emperor Justinian. He ruled between uh, 527 and 565 AD. And during his period, it seems that the Byzantine Empire reached its peak, controlled territory that uh, extended from the Middle East to the Western Europe. But what happened after the plague? The empire started declining. Now the next pandemic was the Black Death. Black Death was the most fatal pandemic ever recorded in human history. It is also known as the Great Mortality. It is also known as Pestilence. And this uh, plague, it traveled from Asia to Europe. And some say that it wiped off nearly half of Europe's population. It was caused by a bacteria, and this bacteria is extinct today, and that time it was spread by fleas. 
which were found in rodents, rodents means uh, rats, squirrels and all. And the bodies of the victims, they were buried in mass graves. The bubonic plague changed the course of Europe's history. So many people died. Labor became very hard to find. So workers had to be with better pay. And this led to the end of the slavery system in Europe. You can find the uh, picture there how the victims of the Black Death, the symptoms being you know, swelling of the lymph nodes and the uh, big boils in the body. And uh, the workers, you know, they were started to get better pay because of the plague. And uh, this led to the end of slavery system. And also, this also might have contributed to technological innovations. Europe. Next is the smallpox. You can find the smallpox vaccine being given to the first uh, person who was a boy. So smallpox was found in Europe, Asia and Arabia for many centuries and it killed almost 3 out of 10 people it infected and uh, most of the people who were infected, they had scars all over their face. And even around us, when we sometimes look around, there might be people with some scars on their face. And the reason would be smallpox. The smallpox virus arrived around the 15th century when the European explorers came. And uh, the people of Mexico, United States, they had zero immunity to smallpox. And in the late 18th century, you can see the picture. Uh, a British doctor named Edward Jenner, he discovered that Milk maids infected with a milder virus called cowpox, they were all immune to this. So what did Jenner do? He inoculated or he vaccinated, he had to test it on someone, isn't it? So who was the first person who he tested this vaccine on, the smallpox vaccine? He tested it on his gardener's son, you can see the lady and his son, nine year old son. And uh, the vaccine was found out. But then. It took about two centuries for World Health Organization to announce that smallpox has been completely eradicated from the earth now. Now we know that it is no longer a uh, serious uh, disease to be reckoned with. And see the child infected with smallpox there. Next is the Cocolipsy epidemic. The Cocolipsy epidemic is a form of viral hemorrhagic fever which affects the brain. And during this time, 1545 to 1548, three year period, it killed around 15 million people in uh, Mexico and Central America. Uh, among the population which was already weakened uh, by drought, etc., this disease was very, very devastating. So what's the meaning of the word populace? It is actually the Aztec word for pest. Yes. So you know that this area was famous for the Aztec and the Inca civilization. A recent study of this epidemic suggests that the skeletons of the victims who were found there were infected with a species, a subspecies, which causes a fever. And this fever causes dehydration, gastrointestinal problems. And even now, this uh, is a very serious threat to the people. Next, we have the American plagues in the 16th century. They were brought to the Americas, Americas in the sense North and South America by the European explorers. So this led to the end of the Inca and the Aztec civilization. 90% of the people died and this disease helped the Spanish explorers. Hernandez Cortes, he conquered the Aztec capital in 1519. Another Spaniard, Francisco Pizarro, conquered the Inca civilization and he established his control. So in both the cases, Aztec and the Inca armies were affected and you know more and more people started coming to colonize these areas. That is the people from Britain, France, Portugal, they started exploring Latin America and they were actually very relieved now because half of the population of these areas were dead because of the plague that took place in the 16th century. Now the 10th plague was the plague of London, 1665 to 1666. It was only for one year. 
But then uh, it caused a mass moving led by King Charles. The plague started in 1605, and uh, the main reason was again the fleet from the rodents, the rats, the squirrels, etc. So by the time the plague ended, nearly one lakh people had died, including 15% of the population of London. So you can see the picture of the plague doctor of those times. The, the doctor who used to treat the plague, uh, plague patients had a big, uh, you know, uh, robe, you know, with a stick in his hand so that he would not touch the patient. And he also had a head ear resembling that of a bird, you know, the bird's uh, type was used. And this was a typical look of the plague doctor of those times. Apart from the plague, London also witnessed a great fire. You can see a picture of a great fire in 1666. So soon after the plague ended, the fire broke out in London and it lasted for four days. I know that it has nothing, nothing to do with the pandemic, but still it destroyed the city entirely soon after the plague. Next we have the Great Plague of Marseille, pronounced Marseille in France, 1722-23, three years. Historical records say that the Great Plague of Marseille started when a ship called Grand Saint Antoine reached Marseille and it was carrying a cargo of goods from the eastern Mediterranean. The ship was quarantined but still the plague got into the sea and mainly through the plague infected rodents, the rats, squirrels, etc. The plague spread quickly and one lakh people died in Marseille and around 30% of the population perished there. Next is a Russian plague, the 12th pandemic, I, I would like to say is about the Russian plague, 1770 to 72. In Moscow, along with the plague, there was also a terror of violence, you know. Nowadays, even sometimes in our places, people who are quarantined, they are resorting to violence because they are all frustrated. The same thing happened in Moscow, people who were under quarantine, they, along with the plague, they also started becoming violent. And um, this ended, this terror period ended with the murder of a bishop, Archbishop Ambrosius. And he asked the people to come for worship. But then the empress of Russia, you can see her picture, Catherine II, she was so desperate, you know, she was known as Catherine the Great. She was so desperate to contain the plague and restore public order that uh, she ordered all the factories moved from Moscow. By the time the plague ended, there were a lot of casualties. And even after the plague, Catherine struggled a lot to restore peace and order. And in 1773, soon after the plague, her husband, her executed husband, Peter III, led a violent movement which also resulted in the death of thousands of people. Now coming to Philadelphia yellow fever epidemic, which ravaged the USA in 1793. So when yellow fever attacked USA, uh, that time Philadelphia was the capital of the US, officials wrongly believed that the African slaves will not get the disease. So the African Negroes, they were asked to nurse the sick people, but then they were also carriers. The disease was transmitted through mosquito bites and it increased mainly during the hot and humid weather in the US. But later, when the winter arrived, the mosquitoes died out and the epidemic ended. And it led to the death of around 5,000 people, not much of a casualty. Next, you have the cholera, which started in England. In the early uh, middle of or the mid 19th century, cholera spread in India. It killed tens of thousands of people. So the prevailing scientific theory, you can find the person who uh, first diagnosed the disease. I will tell you about him. The prevailing scientific theory was that this disease, cholera, was caused by foul air known as miasma. But actually it was this person who you see, John Snow, who was a doctor, Britain. He suspected that the origin of the disease was not from the foul air, it was from London's drinking water. So Snow's efforts did not cure cholera immediately, but it led to 
a global effort to improve urban sanitization and also to protect drinking water from contamination. We all know the importance of bringing pure water nowadays. We know that we are likely to get disease if we don't drink pure water. So, cholera has been largely eradicated in developed countries, but it's still a killer disease in developing countries. We know that we can only depend on mineral water or boiled water or filtered water now. So, in developing countries, we still have inadequate sewage facilities, sewage treatment, and also don't have, everyone doesn't have access to clean water. Next is the flu pandemic, the 15th pandemic, 1889 to 1890. In the modern industrial age, we know that new transport facilities, transport facilities have led to these uh, viruses, especially the flu viruses, to create danger. So, in just a few months, this pandemic, which uh, uh, ravaged uh, Russia and Europe, expanded the globe and it killed millions of people, nearly one million of people, and it took just five weeks for the pandemic to reach its peak. So the earliest cases were reported in St. Petersburg in Russia and also it spread throughout the world. Next we have the American polio pandemic of 1960, which started in New York City. It caused about 27,000 cases and nearly 6,000 people died in the US. The disease mainly affects children and it sometimes leaves survivors with permanent disability, you know, uh, the problems with limbs. Yes. President Roosevelt, you can see the statue of Roosevelt, the president of the US, and he was diagnosed with polio in 1921 at the age of 39. So polio epidemic occurred occasionally in the US and killed many people until, you can see the picture, the vaccine was developed in 1994, the SAC vaccine. So it became widely available and the last polio case reported in the US was in 1979. In India, we have a series of cases. Even now, polio is a very common disease. So worldwide vaccination efforts have greatly reduced the disease. But we haven't completely eradicated it. You know that the WHO has started the Pulse Polio Program. The government also provides free uh, drops of polio for children to prevent the coming of this disease in India. Next, we have the Spanish flu, which is the, uh, you know, uh, it, about 500 million people fell victim to this flu. One fifth of the world died. And uh, the flu spread and danger uh, was increased by the miserable condition of the soldiers and the poor wartime nutrition that many people were experiencing. Why? Because it was during this time that the First World War was ending. The First World War was ending, but more than the number of people who died in the First World War, more people started dying with the Spanish flu. So why was it named Spanish flu? Spain was a neutral country during the First World War, but Spain did not enforce any strict censorship on its press. And that is the reason why the Spanish press was the first press to mention about the uh, Spanish flu, of the flu. That is why this disease is known as the Spanish flu. So as a result, people falsely believe that uh, this disease was specific to Spain, but actually this disease spread to so many countries in the world. So during those times, the closing down of educational institutions was considered as a very important non-pharmaceutical intervention. Because we know that students are very effective in spreading the virus. Even now, we know that schools and colleges are closed. So the timely closing down of uh, schools, the cancelling of public gatherings was significantly associated with the very reduced mortality rate during the Spanish flu. There was no vaccine to protect the people against the infection. You can see the picture there. Uh, it is almost similar to the uh, one we have now, isn't it? People are all being treated in uh, pots which are outside, the tents are all full. So we find the health workers were wearing masks. So there was no vaccine to protect against infection and no antibiotics also during that time, the bacterial infection. But then there were many 
uh, interventions like isolation was practiced then, quarantine was practiced, washing of hands, good personal hygiene, use of, the, use of disinfectants, limitations of public gatherings, all were applied. You can see the picture here, how uh, using telephone was considered as a luxury then, 1980, 1990. Uh, so, you know, people who are in quarantine are not isolated. They have a bell telephone. It is an advertisement, advertisement by a telephone company. And see the notice on the right. During those times, that is, you have to note it is more than 100 years back. All schools, public and private churches, theaters, movie pictures, and all other places will be closed until further notice. So that was uh, the case then, and we still uh, have it now. So history repeats itself. So the next pandemic I would like to mention to you is about the Asian flu. The Asian flu was another global pandemic with its rules in China. Uh, again, one million lives were claimed and it was caused by the H2N2 virus. The disease spread rapidly in uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, in the US, etc. in the year 1997. And, uh, as it originated in China, it was known as the Asian flu. Next is the 1968 pandemic. The 19th pandemic, I'm going to tell you, is about the Hong Kong flu. It was caused by the H3N2 virus, and uh, it was similar to the H2N2 virus of the 1957 pandemic. It was first noticed in the US, even though it was known as Hong Kong flu, and the number of deaths, again, was around 1 lakh. And most of the deaths were in people who are above the age of 65. So even now the H3N2 virus, which causes this pandemic, Hong Kong flu, it is circulated. Even though the virus is considered to be a uh, circulating worldwide. Next is the AIDS pandemic and the epidemic. So it is AIDS is a, an epidemic as well as a pandemic. It is still a, a very huge threat to human health. AIDS became a global pandemic in the 1980s. And uh, we heard about this disease when a very famous uh, Bollywood star, Rock Hudson, fell victim to it. And it has claimed about 35 million lives since it has been identified. Uh, the virus that causes this, as you all know, the HIV virus, the human immunodeficiency virus. And it likely developed from a chimpanzee that the virus was transferred to humans in West Africa early in 1920s itself. But then it was found uh, in the humans, it was diagnosed in 1980s and it became a very severe pandemic. And now about 64% of the people living in the Saharan African areas, they are undergoing they are uh, having this disease. For decades, there was no cure for this disease because it affected the immunity of the person. But luckily, medication developed in the 1990s and now people with this disease are experiencing a normal life with regular treatment. Uh, a cure has been found out and two people were actually cured from HIV early in the now coming to the H1N1 swine flu pandemic of 2009, it lasted only for one year. It started with pigs or the swines and it originated in Mexico. And in one year, the virus infected more than 1 million people across the globe. And uh, this pandemic mainly affected children and young adults. And 80% of the deaths were in people younger than 65. And this was unusual because the flu viruses usually cause death for people above the age of 65. Maybe the people above the age of 65 got immunity because of the previous disease. So this is the uh, picture of the H1N1 swine flu attacking humans. And uh, the severe uh, symptoms include sore throat, etc. And it, it passes through human contact from pigs. So it is an influenza virus. Then coming to the West African Ebola epidemic. Ebola affected West Africa between 14 and 2016. And the first case was reported in Guinea. 
in 19, I mean, in 2030, and then it spread to Liberia and Sierra Leone. And majority of the cases and deaths occurred in these countries, African countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And the number of cases occurred in Nigeria, Senegal, Mali, and then it spread to Europe and US. So there is no cure for Ebola even now. Efforts are going on to find out a vaccine. The last epidemic, that is the 23rd epidemic I would like to focus on, is on the Zika virus epidemic. So it started in, uh, this uh, was in 2015, and uh, scientists are trying their best to find out uh, a cure for this virus. They are trying to bring the virus under control. It is actually spread through the mosquito of the Edus genus, and it can also be sexually transmitted in humans. See, the three methods of transmission are highlighted in this slide. First is through infected mosquitoes. Second is from mother to baby in the womb, and also through sexual activity, and the third is through blood transfusion. So this type of mosquitoes flourish in warm, humid climate, making South America, Central America, and parts of US, southern US, prime areas. And Yes. Yes, I would now like to bring your attention. So I don't want to tell you anything about the present pandemic. All of you know more and more more things than me, I believe. So what I would like to say, my concluding uh, remarks for about ten minutes. That is, a solution to the present pandemic has not been. Revolutionary changes have come up in the present life world. So when we look through a social scientific lens, many changes have happened in the world. And the connection of history as a discipline from the past, it is being reflected in the present also. So we know that history repeats itself. So there will be pandemics in future also. So certain influences can be made. And uh, that I would like to just quickly mention through a, a couple of slides to you. That is, yes, the masked world. It has become very normal now, isn't it? All over the world, irrespective of the states, it can be capitalist state, it can be a communist state. You can't identify a person without a mask. Not without a mask, with a mask. But then, suppose a person comes to you with a without a mask. Yeah, isn't it? So a person with a mask has got a very different meaning. This society. The mask has become a cultural statement now. We respect each other when we wear the mask. So we know that with the mask, we are here to defeat the virus. And there are different kinds of masks av available. You can use designer masks, you can wear, use disposable masks, anything you can use. So masks have become a cultural artifact. Once upon a time, it was used to separate other people, it was used to malign people. But masks now are very, they have a very important role. And it's not only in the present times, throughout history, the pandemic, masks have been used to prevent the spread of the virus and treat the body. Next is the social distancing, which we already discussed. We have physical distancing now, not social distancing. You can see the social distancing in a market in uh, India. Uh, I think it is in North India. So in the pre-COVID times, you know, there was a lot of social integration. There were celebrations, marriages took place, festivals were there. But now we can't celebrate. We are all in confinement. Now, we are not even looking at the calendar because calendar significance has reduced. Schedules have no meaning now. Timetables have become irrelevant. They are only passed off. Even distances, physical distance has lessened. You know how the migrant laborers, they walk thousands and thousands of kilometers to their homes, far away homes. What was our, what was uh, us teachers? What is the condition? We are also distance from home, from our students. We are not able to see them physically. We are only able to see them online through the classes. Also new medical systems have come up. There is more bonding of family. Family 
uh, relations have become very, very good now. Music and other art forms have become a therapy now because all of us are living under fear. So we need things like music and dance to overcome that. Film field has changed. Films are uh, being released online. All of us cannot watch such films only if we have the facilities we can use. But still, that is a change that has come up. And then quarantine, human bodies are segregated. Do we like to be in quarantine? No, none of us like. Because our bodies are separated. But it has brought in a new historical legacy. Uh, this confinement is something which is very, very bad. It can happen. It is the worst thing that can happen to anyone. But you know, great ideas come during quarantine. Especially, you know, Prince wrote, not Prince, uh, Macaulay wrote his famous book, Prince, during uh, confinement. So sometimes events become important in You know how this virus, the coronavirus has influenced our life. Earlier it was a bacteria, now it is a virus. The so masks and sanitizers, sanitizers came one fine morning. So the pandemic is actually a great event. Now the present pandemic is the greatest event of the century. But once the vaccine is invented, what will happen? The whole crisis is gone. Then we'll have to wait for another 20 years for the next pandemic to come. But there is one intense consciousness, collective emotion, cultural emotion of fear. Was there fear in the earlier period? Yes. Even in the ancient world and in the medieval world, there was this cultural evolution of fear. In modern times, virus has taken over. There is no class distinction for this. Everybody is undergoing fear. If rich, poor, if anybody, teachers are also fearing. Why? Because we are not able to take classes properly. Our online classes are something new which we are doing. So we are also fearing. So the state is now a savior. The government is a savior for us now. The police uh, is surveilling. I mean, they are looking or supervising us. We are forced to obey the orders of the government. The fundamental rights are affected. Same was the case earlier. In earlier days also, people are had to give up their fundamental rights. But health workers are heroes. Public health care system is glorified. Isn't it? Uh, so the governments are trying their best to reduce the severity of the pandemic. So one great lesson the pandemic has taught us is that it is globalization, no, that we need. We need global integration. We need to have support systems. We need to help each other. So we can see the interdependency of human civilization. We have all become global citizens now. We have become more humanistic. So we should see that in future, instead of celebrating uh, the marriages of our relatives, knowing our luxurious uh, methods, we can follow that. We can understand that such things can be contained by us. But now, the, now the government is not allowing us to uh, celebrate. But we can also take it as a lesson and see that it is the ambitious nature of human beings that the pandemics all the time. So coming to the concluding remarks, pandemics are actually historical foxes. They are neither the beginning nor the end because when we saw the 23 pandemics that uh, shook human history, find each one of them ended giving rise to a much healthier society later. So even the present pandemic is the greatest cause of this century. It is neither the beginning nor the end. There is also confinement. We know that we have so many advancements now. Digital technology is improving. So many online platforms, uh, digital tools, but still we are confined. We are not given the full freedom by our governments because of the spread of the virus. The poorer section, the vulnerable people. Some of us are enjoying life because we are having steady income. But what about the poor people, the contract laborers, the people, daily wage workers? You can see the dichotomy here. Right? Sides of the coin. And are the humans the main issue here? Are we responsible for all the pandemics that have occurred in human history? No. Maybe uh, 
some person we are responsible but then the system is so what is the problem with the system that we are living in we um, the humans are brought into the system which is an integration of technologies science and we have the capitalist system so we have to see the entire system the humans are only one chain the whole system so we are subject to this rationality so pandemics will come in future also and finally we have understood man's obsession with technology that is very evident now and uh, that will again increase with the future also so to that i come to the end of my talk on uh, mapping the history of pandemics thank you if you have any questions uh, i can take it from the chat box thank you for sharing your valuable information ma'am in you in you to more number of participants attended the meetings ma'am okay more appreciations received ma'am thank you so much it's a pleasure it's my pleasure ma'am yes you can ask yeah uh, put in the chat box ma'am Uh, read the question, ma'am. Sure. About two thirds of all infections in your diseases in humans have their origins in animals because of human activity against environment. What is your opinion, ma'am? Um. See, uh, my opinion is that sometimes animals may be responsible, but then even during the present COVID-19 pandemic. There was a rumor that uh, it it is because of the association with pets that this pandemic took place. But I wouldn't say so. This present pandemic, you find that in Arabia, in the Gulf areas, when the COVID-19 broke out, all the people they started giving away their pets, the pets that they had in their home, the cats, etc. But you know, in the UK, people started keeping more pets. You know why? Because they found that keeping pets would be Good for their, uh, I mean, uh, to to remove their fear factor. So uh, there are many diseases which are starting from animals. So you should always give proper vaccination, etc., for your pets before keeping them in your homes, and see that they are immune to diseases. That is what I would like to say. I have uh, two pets at home. You know, I have two dogs, and both of them are uh, uh, inside the home. So. Uh, we have given them proper uh, vaccination etc so i i we don't fear that they would give us any disease thank you ma'am the next question yeah. is yeah what's your opinion about herd immunity herd immunity yeah. what is that you mean to say uh, animal immunity what do you mean by that herd immunity Can you explain uh, herd immunity? What is this? Actually, they have given herd immunity. H E R D herd immunity. Ah, this must be something to do with the animal immunity only. Okay. I think I have answered to that earlier. Okay, ma'am. I think there is one one more question which I read somewhere here. There is another question. Ah, uh, if you can read, uh, Doctor Mekla, if you can read that, please. Okay, ma'am. Yes. How the pandemic situation carried away? Because till now there is no immunization. No, till now. Ah, see, many diseases have been eradicated, like the smallpox, etc. But you know, the virus actually the all the pandemics are uh, occurring due to viruses, and each virus will be different, isn't it? Sometimes it be a new virus, sometimes it be a variant of the old virus. So. Even I mean, only at certain point of time, you can say that some diseases can be eradicated. But certain diseases will keep on occurring, and that is because of the nature of the pandemic or the epidemic. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Because How are these pandemic caused? Somebody was a pandemics are caused due to viruses and bacteria. Because I was telling about the influenza. Then he has asked about the pandemic. See, influenza pandemics are the worst pandemic because they affect the respiratory system, you know, uh, and uh, it causes uh, 
cleaning problems, etc. Viral infections come. So actually, the influenza pandemics are shortened and we call them as flu. We say that this person, some person has got a flu. That is actually the short form of influenza. What are the lessons that we have learned from the past two chapters? Yes, the lessons that we have learned is uh, to be united, to have humanitarian considerations, not to overcrowd, I mean, in the sense, to uh, see that the environment is protected, not to disturb the environment, see that uh, uh, we are less greedy for what I mean, that we are happy with what we have, not go after uh, you know, unwanted luxuries of life, etc. Herd immunity refers to certain percentage of immune people. Thank you for giving me that uh, information. Yes. So maybe some people are immune, yeah. I don't know whether you mean this. So some of us, you know, even though if we are carriers of uh, the coronavirus, symptoms will not be seen, obviously. But we will be transmitting the disease to the person in contact. So certain people are, by birth, they are immune to diseases. So even if we touch a person with the virus, we will not get the disease. So immunity differs from person to person. Some people are susceptible to the disease more, others are not. Some people have great immunity uh, power. That's why, you know, every day, even I am taking vitamin C pills every day so that I improve my immunity to fight against uh, the coronavirus. Are there any more questions? Participants, if you have any queries, you can unmute your audio and ask your question. Yeah, I would also like to mention here yeah, the difference between epidemic, pandemic and endemic, just uh, for information's sake. Epidemic is a disease that we find in just a small community in a country. It doesn't go beyond that. That is endemic. So epidemics are actually diseases which affect certain communities of people in a country and it doesn't have a widespread. But at the same time, when epidemics spread beyond countries, beyond continents, and uh, it crosses borders, epidemics are called pandemics. That's the basic difference between pandemic, epidemic, and pandemic. Uh, madam, a question from our control of examinations, madam. Definitely. Uh, madam, when will the pandemic end? Pandemic never, pandemics will never end because I told you increased urbanization. We are not going to go back to the road age. We are not going to go back to the village community. We are not going to go back to the early day of life. We are only going to progress. And man, you know, you remember the last inference I made in my conclusion, obsession with technology. So man is obsessed with technology. He wants more and more. He's not satisfied with this. So first we had the zoo, app, then we had the Go, uh, then we had the Google Meet. So we are finding out new new tools. If we want to express ourselves more, and then we want more and more sophisticated ways of life. So pandemics will never end. There will be pandemics in future also, and the future pandemics will be more disastrous, will be more devastating, devastating than the ones we have now. The present COVID. A 19 pandemic is of course highly uh, destructive and we still haven't found out about we still haven't found out a, a solution we still found, haven't found out a vaccine for this but we will maybe in a couple of months or in a year we will have a virus i mean we'll have a vaccine which will be uh, found out but then after that in another 20 years we will have another pandemic for sure Biological war, I don't want to comment on that. Uh, uh, there are many people who feel that viruses are usually biological weapons which are, um, you know, purposefully uh, done by uh, some countries. I don't want to mention that. But then these are, I feel such uh, issues are uh, made up, you know. 
And uh, of course, bioterrorism is now a very serious issue. The global security itself. The global security is now being threatened because of bioterrorism, that is, using of biological weapons for uh, causing fear, etc. But I don't think the present pandemic is a biological war. Maybe it is. I had one more question. I think. Are these prevent? Yes. Are these prevent? To avoid. Uh, do you have any suggestions? I don't know, but I think that once we keep ourselves healthy and hygienic, uh, we have all changed our lifestyles, isn't it? We have become more health conscious. We have started doing exercises. We have started using masks and sanitizers uh, very often. So I think if we look into all these things. It is more than enough, I think. But then, uh, sometimes uh, we tend to, you know, over overshoot. This. Sometimes we try to become very confident of ourselves that the virus will not affect us, and then we tend to go out without our masks. Uh, we uh, refuse to use a sanitizer, hand sanitizer, etc. So I think uh, present uh, uh, preventive measures are more than enough. But people should be more aware. People should be more conscious that if this disease can affect us anytime, anywhere in the world. Use of facial masks can be a potential source. Um, potential source for what do you mean? Use of facial masks. Potential source means I didn't get your point. Mask using a mask is very important because. And the mask that we use should not be, uh, you know, for the sake of using. It should cover your nose as well as your mouth, and the mask should be, be layered. Potential source in cities, of course. Potential source. You mean to say that in cities it's a must, and then uh, it's very important because the cities are overcrowded, and uh, the proper use is very important because. Uh, it's not a very thin mask that you wear. A designer mask, which is matching with your attire, you wear it, and then it is not at all uh, a preventive one. And the, the use of the mask is to prevent the virus from entering our mouth, entering our body through the mouth or the. So it is always better to wear three-layer mask, and I would suggest the medical mask, which is disposable, which you get in uh, uh, pharmacies, which is the best way to prevent. It. Uh, the entry of the virus. We also have studio hall. Okay, I would also like to tell you that in a town in Kerala, in Kottayam, they have the studio mask. You can go, you go to that place, it's a studio, you can take a picture of yours, photo, with the nose and the mouth, and then uh, will be imprinted on the mask, and you can wear it so that people can identify you. You know, it's very difficult to identify a person you don't know without a mask. So these are the studio masks, and there are different types of masks. The mask should be worn properly with uh, the proper uh, material. How long can you use a reusable mask? <laughs> that you should ask a doctor. But a reusable mask, I think, depends on the uh, material. If the mask is a cloth mask, I think you can reuse it. And uh, but then every day it has to be washed. The reusable mask. Not that you use it, then come and dump it somewhere, and then the next day you go out, you, you use the same mask. You have to wash it, and then you have to use it the next day. So only then the virus will be killed. Ma'am, one more question. Sure. Is it safe to take vitamin C tablet without doctor's advice? It is safe. It is safe to take because I am taking every day. And uh, vitamin C uh, doesn't do any harm to the body. You can also take citrus fruits. I am not a doctor to advise all this. But I take a lemon every day. Uh, I drink lemon water every day. It's, it's a good immunity booster. And you can take citrus fruits. And uh, uh, vitamin C pills are also harmless. In fact, they are good for your body. Yes, warm weather. Weather is a very important factor. Yes, uh, 
for the COVID, the virus. But then, uh, you know, uh, studies are being held regarding uh, even the origin. Now they are saying it is airborne, the disease is airborne. So usually, warm weather incubates the pandemic, depending on the virus. What kind of fruits and vegetables? If citrus fruits are very, uh, you are asking me as though I am a dietitian or a <laughs> So whatever information I know, whatever knowledge I know, I tell you, I think citrus fruits are best. Fruits which are rich in vitamin C are best for the boosting immunity. In future, do we get a word that is possible like that? Oh, yes, you can expect different kinds of viruses to attack us in future. I don't know what the name of the next virus is going to be. Thank you so much, Dr. Vikarish. Ma'am, one more question, ma'am. Yes. What are the precautions to be taken for kids below 10 years in the pandemic? Is there any way to improve a natural immunity? Ah, uh, see, uh, I don't know whether I am uh, fit enough to answer such questions. Maybe a pediatrician will be able to. But still, I think students can be given fruits and vegetables, and then it's better that you don't send them out of the home. That's the best way. So students, don't send them out of your the out of the four walls of your home. But I know it is also causing a lot of problems to them. Uh, you know, they are always addicted to the mobiles and computers and. You know, but we have no other go. The most important thing uh, that we are now concerned is the safety of our children and the elders. So the children below the age of 10 and elders above the age of 65 should not, should never step out of their home. And uh, they should have good uh, protein diet with uh, fruits, vegetables, etc. And also turmeric is a very good uh, immune boost. So what uh, one of my friends who is a doctor, she advised me to drink water, boil with turmeric, then pepper, then uh, tulsi leaves, uh, then omum. I don't know the English for the omum. So all these put together can be boiled and uh, instead of taking plain water, you can take it occasionally. You can um, pour the water in a flask and you can drink the water. So turmeric is there. Not the powder turmeric, but the solid turmeric. Turmeric, then pepper, then uh, tulsi leaves, and then oma. Uh, it's called ayamodagam in Malayalam. I don't know what it is called in Tamil. So you boil all those and then you uh, leave it and then you drink it regularly. It's a very, very good thing. Uh, uh, and even uh, turmeric, you can even uh, burn it in the sense you can show it, the fumes of the turmeric, you can show it in every nook and corner of the house. We do it every day in our house. So turmeric, uh, you can burn it with some uh, husk or coconut or uh, some charcoal and you can just take it around the whole house in every nook and corner in the evening time for about 10 minutes or so and the fumes of the turmeric are said to be a very good disinfectant and this can even uh, prevent any viral disease. We used to do it even earlier when there were viral fevers in the homes. You know when one of the one of us in any one of the homes is infected with a virus, any viral fever, we used to do it in our homes. You know, burning of this turmeric. And the, the fumes, you know, inhaling the fume. You don't have to inhale it directly. You just take it around the entire uh, house and then the fumes are very good to prevent the viral attack. The viruses will uh, be dead. That's what, from experience. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your information and thank you for your answers, ma'am. Now I request Dr. R. Kalaiwani, Assistant Professor in History, to give word of thanks. It's my great, great privilege.
village to propose vote of thanks. First of all, I would like to thank our Madam Principal Webinar. Next, I thank our Head of the Department, Mrs. B. Ramya, for her support throughout this webinar. Next, I thank Dr. U. Uma Devi, uh, Head of the Department of Nutrition and Diet, for delivering presidential address. Next, I thank our today's speaker, Dr. Parvati Menon, Assistant Professor of History, All Saints College, Trivandrum, Kerala, for delivering keynote address on the topic, Mapping the History of Pandemics. In her presentation, Madam highlighted the history of pandemics throughout the ages, full map, and we can learn about the pandemics in this pandemic situation. Thank you very much, ma'am. Next, I thank Dr. M. Kavita and Dr. Jimmick's tireless effort for organizing this national webinar in a grand success. Next, I thank my department colleagues for their support. Last but not least, I thank my fellow faculty members in my college and other colleges and from universities for their participation and keen observation throughout this webinar. Last but not least, I thank all the students, PhD scholars in my college, in other colleges and all the universities.